संसार दावा नलनीर धोका तराय पादुन घना घना क्यं प्राप्त शकलन गुनान वर्षा Radha Krishna and the cow It was now the beginning of December and 5:30 in the morning chanting on my beads I walked up the steep stairway to the train station to take my one and a half hour ride on the four or five trains to the temple from my parents house in the Bronx The New York subway system looked like the proverbial horror movie The IRT train rolled back and forth for about 20 minutes, forcing everyone to hold on for dear life to the poles and hanging hand straps. A few stations after the rattling train went underground, I got off to change to the IND subway line. Walking through that station was like walking through a smelly hellish realm. The artificial lighting caused the connecting tunnels to emit an eerie glow. and the arriving and departing trains roared as if there was an earthquake overhead i boarded the next train some of the people in the subway car stared at each other blankly as though they were hypnotized some held newspapers in front of their faces staring at headlines announcing death by murder death by traffic accident death by old age or death through the war in vietnam i had faith that my fellow passengers would benefit spiritually by hearing krishna's name even if they did not understand the meaning or significance so i chanted louder than usual at canal street I got off to change trains for the third time. It was 6:30 and the station was now filled with thousands of people. Although most of them were passengers, many were homeless, living right there in the station. To escape the fetid suffocating air, I tried not to inhale as I made my way down the platform. How could all these people not die of hopelessness without Krishna consciousness? I remembered my new ever new spiritual master explaining that a traveler absorbed in contemplating his destination perhaps to the home of an intimate old friend is not disturbed on board a crowded stuffy or uncomfortable bus. The traveler is simply thinking of where he is going. Similarly, a devotee is not disturbed by awkward situations because he keeps his mind focused on the goal of love for Krishna and going back to Godhead. I wasn't focused to that extent, but at least I was happily thinking about going to see my guru and his temple. About two stations away from Second Avenue, a young man took the seat next to me. Recognizing the tilak or devotional markings on my forehead and japa beads in my hand, he asked me a few questions about Krishna consciousness. Then he challenged, "What's wrong with killing cows? And what's wrong with eating meat anyway?" I responded as best I could. but my answers didn't satisfy him i knew that krishna is a vegetarian and we offer all our food to him before we eat i also knew that animals have consciousness and feel pain and i knew about tit for tat that is the law of karma as we kill animals for their flesh they will kill us in a future birth I had become a vegetarian only a couple of months before. Acknowledging my lack of wisdom, I invited the young man to the temple to put his questions before Prabhupad. He said he had something else to do, so we parted. 
Shortly thereafter, I arrived at the temple and attended the morning program. When morning class was over, I went upstairs to begin painting. The encounter with that young man still on my mind. Prabhupada greeted me as he often did, saying, Jadu Rani, somehow making me feel as if we were the only two people in the world. Swamiji, I tried to speak to someone on the train this morning, but I am frustrated by the way it turned out. I couldn't properly answer this man's challenge about meat eating. Can you tell me what I should have said? What have you done? Prabhupada replied in an accusatory tone of voice. I was speechless. What did I do? Did I do something wrong? What have you done for society? He repeated. The cow gives so much to society in the form of milk, which is made into many health-giving products. Milking the cow means drawing the principles of religion in liquid form. The great rishis or saints and munis or sages would live only on milk. What have you given? Phew! He was only showing me how I could have addressed the young man on the train. I repeated the man's words. He said, Nowhere in the Bible is it mentioned that meat eating is sinful or that a meat eater can't enter the kingdom of God. He purposely used neither the Bible nor the Vedas in his answer. You have to use common sense, he retorted. Suppose one's son kills and eats his less intelligent brother. If the son then boasts... Oh, father, I've just killed your foolish son. Would his father, who loves both sons, be pleased? He summed up his view by explaining that all beings in all species of life are Krishna's children and that Krishna loves them all. I had heard this before, but it had never meant as much as it did then. He continued, Better qualified sons should not live by exploiting those less fortunate, and that includes the animals. He described briefly how calves are taken from their mothers just after their birth and subsequently slaughtered. These sinful acts are responsible for all the trouble in the present society. As he spoke, a few tears fell from his eyes. Cow is mother, he shared with me. She supplies milk, and you are killing her. It is like killing your mother. Is that any kind of gratitude? Is that advancement of civilization? Every 25 years, there is a big war, war and crime. This is their punishment, their reaction, and they will suffer more. Now they are repenting, and they will have to repent more and more. I thought of the Vietnam War and what he had once said about it. In America, there are thousands of cows whose calves are mercilessly taken away from them. Now, as a karmic result, so many mothers were having their sons taken away from them and slaughtered in Vietnam. I looked at my spiritual master, who was lost in his own thoughts. I then turned my gaze to the picture on the wall. It was an Indian print of a youthful, debonair Krishna, who looked about 14 years old, and who stood on top of the earth globe, holding his flute. A beautiful white cow standing behind him craned her neck to look lovingly in his direction. 
After staring at the picture for a moment, I turned back toward Prabhupada. His eyes looked so full of love. Though I had no idea of the nature of his love or the extent of it, even a novice like me could see that he was full of affection for all. I was almost embarrassed to look at him again. I felt completely unqualified and at the same time completely lucky to be in his presence. One day, I was sweeping the floor in the altar area while Prabhupada spoke with a few disciples in the next room. I heard him mention my name and then saw him motion toward me. I strained to catch the words, Krishna's housewife. Flattered, I swept more enthusiastically. When he finished speaking with the devotees, he called me into his room. Just wait a minute, he said. He walked over to his almira and pulled out a volume of Srimad Bhagavatam. Handing me its dust jacket, he asked me to duplicate the cover art in a large painting. The whole thing? I asked, observing the many forms of Krishna within the spiritual planets that were all floating like bubbles in a yellow and blue spiritual sky. No, only the middle section. Just Radha and Krishna and two cows in Vrindavan, Krishna's personal abode. I was learning that Vrindavan is the highest region in the spiritual world, as Sri Krishna is the source of innumerable incarnations, his personal abode, Golok Vrindavan, which is shaped like a lotus flower, is the source of infinite spiritual planets. To reach this place is the goal of life. On my way to the art store to purchase supplies, I noticed Hayagriva speaking with a guest. When the guest asked him why Krishna is blue, he replied, The Swami just answered that the other day. He said that the shade of Krishna's blue complexion is the most beautiful color existing. He says you can ask, Why is the sky blue? It's because the sky is a reflection of Krishna's body. Meditating on this thought-provoking concept, I continued my journey to the store. I was in the midst of applying the first layer of color when Prabhupada came over and told me, you can paint Radha and Krishna's palms reddish and give them attractive colorful garlands. It was hard to see the details on the tiny cover picture. Besides lovely Radha and Krishna appearing only two inches tall, the cover had obviously not been printed on the best of Indian presses. The primary red, blue and yellow were misaligned. As Prabhupada squatted in the way Indians typically do, sitting with his knees fully bent and only his feet touching the floor, he told me that the trees in the background were desire trees known in Sanskrit as Kadamba. Whatever you like, you can get from these trees, he said. In this world, from apple trees you get apples, from mango trees, mangoes. But in the spiritual world, any time, anything you like, you can have. It sounded magical for sure, but I had no idea what a kadamba tree looked like. As I tried to copy the tiny image rather than a forest of wish-fulfilling trees, my kadamba trees appeared as a light green space with large dark green and small brownish green stars. When the painting was nearly done, Prabhupada came over again and crouched down to study it. He handed me a small piece of paper on which he had written a Sanskrit mantra complete with its diacritical marks to indicate the correct phonetic pronunciation. 
नमो ब्राह्मण्य देवाय गो ब्राह्मण हिताय च जगदिताय कृष्णाय गोविंदय नमो नम I offer my respectful obeisances to the supreme absolute truth Krishna who is the well wisher of the cows and the brahmanas as well as all living entities in general I offer my obeisances to Govinda who is the pleasure reservoir of all the senses and especially the senses of his devotees He asked me to copy the prayer onto the lower right side of the canvas near the lotus feet of Sri Radha who is also called Radha Rani the queen of Vrindavan I would find out later that her name Radhika meaning she who worships Krishna also means she whom Krishna worships doubting my ability to print the letters nicely i used letter stencils soon after prabhupad hung the painting in his apartment three indian gentlemen visited him and he called me into his room to meet them i watched as he offered his guests some indian sweets called peda and saw how they first touched the sweets to their heads and then ate them without touching their hands to their mouths out of the corner of his eye he quickly glanced in my direction indicating that i note their reverential behavior and followed their example he directed his guests to look through the glassless window between our two rooms at the painting now hanging above his small oblong altar She is not painting out of concoction he told them she is authorized by higher authorities i was stunned and touched for me of course that higher authority was prabhupad himself i knew no one else at the same time his words confirmed for me my connection to his authorized spiritual lineage his disciplic succession after the guests left i told him that i felt discouraged about how the painting had turned out it was too crude and flat i said it seems like every painting i do is worse than the previous one a part of me wanted him to reply oh no you're getting better and better you're doing wonderfully but instead he said what can you do the demigods are painting krishna and radharani is painting krishna what can you do i prayed to krishna to make me humble bande gura se charan harapnam to prabhu na priya eva darsha bande gura se charan harapnam sanshara dhamar nalinda loka 